One of the most common questions I get is, what is the most important emotion in B2B? And I'll, and, and I'll say, it's not one, it's multiple. There are clusters of emotions. So one cluster is self-image and the other is social. But the motivation really is from within. Before we do any analysis on the pages, we'll actually go to the customer research. Mm. Once we have that mapped out and we present this to the client, we'll say, okay, does this all add up? What are the things that we're missing? And then we'll present and say, here's who we're speaking to. Here's what you are saying on your website. Mm. Here's what you should be saying. Uh. You don't have to be a magician because once you have that data, you'll look at it and you're like, oh, I'm telling stories that don't resonate. Hey, welcome to the Message Market Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Silvestri. And if you're new here, this is a show where I chat with B2B SaaS folks in marketing, product, growth, and founders about how they join the conversation already happening in their customers' minds. We dive deep into their thinking, their systems, and their playbooks to see how they empathize with their audience and speak to them in a way that resonates. So they're compelled to take action. Join us and learn how you too can shape your messaging strategy and write copy that truly resonates and differentiates you. I'm fired up for my guest today, Talia Wolf. Talia is the CEO at GetUplift, helping B2B brands increase conversions through customer-first CRO and emotional resonance. In this episode, we chat about the power of emotional targeting in B2B marketing and Talia's approach to testing and optimizing across the entire customer journey. We also discuss the importance of understanding customers' emotional drivers and much, much more. Warning, it's a very, very nerdy conversation. Let's dive right in. Hey, Talia. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm good. How are you? Awesome. Me too. I I'm, was looking forward to this chat just because I think when I started out, it was, I think, maybe 2016 or 2017. I remember starting a course that you created with CXL. I think it was about emotional triggers or emotional targeting. Cool. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I have a lot of questions on all of that and more than I want to ask you. But why don't we start with uh, some of your background? So I know you were a marketing director, for example, Monday.com and other companies. How did you turn into that and then into a consultant? It, it's funny because I, I actually started out in social media marketing and really was just in charge of paid campaigns, but also creative campaigns. And it was really back in the day when what people what most brands cared about was likes and engagement and you didn't really measure stuff back then. Yeah. So that's where I started flirting with CRO without knowing it was CRO because I was asking all these questions that no one knew answers to. I was like, this is really cool. You got 5,000 likes, but hey, are you seeing any sales? And they're like, how are we supposed to know? So that's where I started. Yeah. I left the social media world and I started working at monday.com it was then the pulse it was three people sitting in a broom in a broom closet let's be honest it's not as sexy as it sounds now it sounds sexy <laughs> because it's monday yeah. but that was we did everything and they were they, they were good friends of mine they were like come and work with us of course i'll come and work with you this sounds fun i did that for about a year and then i worked at Conversiona, which was the first conversion optimization agency I yeah. actually worked for. I managed the company. It wasn't mine, but I managed the company and I built a team of around 25, at one point, maybe 30 people where we did conversion optimization. And I didn't really know what conversion optimization was before this, because obviously I'd be doing it when I was at the social media world. I, in the, the social media agency, I was testing things. I didn't, not obviously, not statistically, but I was testing stuff. I was trying things in ads and I was trying things on Facebook. And I kept thinking, well, if I change this image, if I change this button, if I write a new landing page, but I didn't know it was CRO. And I was finally introduced to it. And then I joined this CRO agency and I fell in love. This is, yes, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And I ran that company for a few years and it was great. It's why I started my speaking career and I started doing, I did a lot of trial and error with A-B testing. Oh my gosh, 
wow, did I mess up so much? Because I, I didn't have a process. And then we developed the process. And then the founders sold the company. And I had a brief moment where I said, you know what? I'll go work with you guys on this new startup thing. And then I hated it. I was like, I'm going back to CRO and I'm going to do my own thing. And then I started to get uplift. So this was back in 2016, I think. Yeah. And... Yeah, I'd be do I was doing conversion optimi optimization beforehand, obviously, for a few years, but starting my own thing was a whole other beast. And that's also when I collaborated with CXL on that course you mentioned. It makes me feel so old. Yeah, and ever since, I've been running Get Uplift, and we do conversion optimization for B2B brands, and it's all based on psychology and emotion hmm. and figuring out the real intent behind B2B purchases, how they make decisions and creating better experiences through that. Yeah. What, uh, I'm curious, did you all always work in a B2B SaaS space or also e-commerce or other industries? A type of product. And I will say, yes, <laughs> I've sold toilet paper, cardboard boxes, canvases, QA software for uh -huh. engineers. We've done everything. The our sweet spot is definitely B2B. We've been doing that for a few years and we have a lot of experience in it, mostly because it's the most challenging one, I think, mm. in my kind of process and the framework that I built around emotion. Most people are like, yeah, we know people buy on emotion, but not in B2B. Uh -huh. B2B is technical. And it's like, nope, let me stop you right there and let me show you how we do that stuff. So I get most excited to talk about mm. emotion in B2B. Yeah, I wanted to look at uh, emotion from different lenses as well. And on the Get Up Lift website, your value prop is the first conversion, methodolo first conversion methodology that uses data and emotional analysis. What do you mean by emotional analysis? Really, when I talk about emotion, I think people think like fluffy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like the cute little thing where you have a nice image of a lady sitting there. Um, like a scammy sales page, long form sales page. <laughs> Exactly. So that's definitely not what I'm talking about. When we talk about emotional analysis or we talk about emotional resonance, because ultimately when people buy, they buy on emotion, especially in B2B, there's a lot of different things that will impact whether you buy something or not. We've done a lot of research that shows when in a B2B purchase, a prospect will come to the website They'll land on the homepage. They'll go straight to the pricing page just to make sure that the pricing is mm -hmm. the same as the other products that they're looking into and comparing. But then they'll go back to specific pages to see if it resonates with what they care about and if it solves a specific solution for them. And that's where emotion comes in. When, when B2B buyers uh, are on a website, they're not just thinking about the features, the pricing. They're not just thinking about the technology. They're also thinking about their own personal benefits. So a lot of everything that we look at is through that lens of an emotional analysis. So does your website connect mm. and relate? Can people come to your website and really feel like you are telling the stories they care about? Are you talking about, are you solving a specific problem for them that makes sense? Yeah. And that resonates with them. And that's where emotional analysis comes in. Yeah. Why do you think in B2B, especially people underestimate the, the strength, the power of emotion? I think we've somehow convinced ourselves that B2B is very different than B2C. And you think, I know people don't think this when they sit down for a second and they're like, of course, I'm not selling to a building. But everything on the website and every piece of marketing that they do is around that. It's they're selling to a building and not a person. They're thinking there's no emotion. There's no psychology. They're looking at features, pricing, technology. Everything has to be boring, corporate, don't, don't engage too much, don't, you have to look serious. And I think it's, it's very uh, challenging for marketers to say, wait, this person behind the screen actually does have some concerns and they also have specific problems that they're trying to solve. And we're not talking about those at all. It's very risky to talk about these kind of things. And when you see the biggest brands in B2B just saying the all-in-one solution for blah, 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 or powered by AI, it just feels less risky to say the same. Yeah. But you can take that, the number one whatever in the world, and you could put that on any B2B company and you wouldn't know which is which. So it's a lot harder and it takes foundational work. Like you have to do real research mm -hmm. to figure out the original 
triggers, the emotional resonance, to really understand pains and the challenges and the desired outcomes that B2B buyers have. It's a lot easier to just go into Google Analytics and pull a graph and say, they are 37 years old, oh, this yeah. is their job title, and they live in the US. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy segment. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times um, emotional resonance. Um, how do you define that and how do you understand, okay, this message, this design resonates with prospects? So when we talk about emotional resonance, we talk about it throughout the entire customer journey, not just that first impression, but everything that you put on your website or in an email or in an ad should resonate on an emotional level with your customers. And what that means is digging into the problems you're trying to solve, the real problems. And you have to really understand those. You have to do real research, right? Yeah. You have to do interviews. You have to uh, survey your customers. You have to survey visitor web website visitors. You have to do a lot of different things to understand yeah. the real problem that you're trying to solve, especially when you're in a saturated market. And in B2B, they're mostly in competitive industries, right? Most of them have 10 other companies that are doing exactly the same. And let's face it, they're doing exactly the same. And even if you have one feature that's better, then the next competitor can do that. Like a few months and they'll have that. Okay. So where do you stand out? So a lot of our work focuses on let's choose a specific pain and problem that really addresses what your customers care about. What is the one big problem that you're trying to address? The way we test this is by testing. So we'll do our research, which we can get into in a minute, but we'll do our research. We'll come up with a hypothesis. I think if we tell these stories or if we integrate this type of social proof, or if we write this kind of copy, or if we choose these kind of images, this will resonate more. This will hit these aha moments quicker and then we'll get more trials, we will get more sales, we will get more leads. That is what we go out to test. So everything that we come up with, any hypothesis that we have, we then test using A-B testing or other, other ways if a lot of times in B2B you don't have enough traffic mm -hmm. or versions to run complete A-B tests, but there are other ways you can opt to it. So we're constantly testing this stuff out to see if it resonates. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. You go back to the research and you revisit it and you try something else. Yeah, and I wanted to mention, because you mentioned like words like powered by AI, the kind of jargon stuff that people use. And But I had, in some cases with my clients as well, we do all the research, I come up with the copy, but then in the end, especially if it's like a more established company with their voice and tone guidelines, they like force those, like that language on you. And they like, I try to push back, but sometimes it's not possible. So how would you do that? How would you convince them that those words are <laughs> shit and don't work? I'm going to, I'm going to say what most people don't say. Probably sometimes I just don't. Sometimes I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, this is not some superstar story. I don't have any secrets. I use my research, our research as a team to say, look, this isn't what people care about. Mm. Okay. And my client might come back and say, sure, cool, but we're still going to say this. And I will say, cool beans, but if we're going to say this, let's add the emotional benefit. So if you want to say you're powered by AI, or if you want to talk about a specific feature, a lot of the frameworks that I teach, and I, I'm not a copywriter, just to be like very mm -hmm. clear. I'm a CRO. We have a conversion of copywriting team, obviously, which is incredible. But when I talk about emotion, one thing that I teach is you if, if you want to focus on your features, that's great. That's important. But you have to add the desired outcome. What is the emotional outcome that your customer is going to get from this? Mm -hmm. So if you want to say palette by, by AI, okay, I'm with you. How does this make their life better? And not because it's going to make it faster, quicker. Uh, <laughs> what is the actual benefit to this? Like with one of our clients, it was, hey, using our co-pilots, you will actually save 100 hours mm. in this task. And I'm like, yes, okay. So that's right. That. Let's not just say powered by AI. Let's say save 100 hours doing X task with our co-pilot. Yeah, that yeah. is different. Yeah, totally. And, and when it comes to, to messaging, 
you mentioned how sometimes it's not about distincting features that you have as an advantage, but sometimes it's just language or the messaging that you use. So I had this kind of like debate with other people on the podcast as well. So some people say that message market fit sometimes comes before product market fit, especially for early stage companies. But there's also the kind of struggle with over promising or saying things that you're not really able to do. So how do you balance that? It's a good question. I think first you really have to understand who you're speaking to because a lot of the times it's easier to talk about the product than it is to, to talk about customers. We worked with Teamwork for a while, which is uh, for a few years, and they are a project management solution. They compete with ClickUp. They, they compete with Monday.com. <laughs> they compete with Asana. And when you take it at face value, anyone can use the product, right? Like ultimately, you could probably do the same with every single PM software out there. They have the same features. They have the same most of them have the same jargon on their website. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there that makes you stand out. What Teamwork did very smartly, and it's one of the things I love about them, is they said, you know what? The people that we're speaking to, and this is because the founders were, came from a consulting background, the people we're speaking to are client services. Now, they could have said, it's everyone. No, it's client services. People who do client work should use Teamwork. And when you go to their website, you will see that, yes, you could probably, if you go to the features and the technology, you'll be like, oh, this is, yeah, like I can do this. There's every, it's everywhere. Like yeah. all these features exist everywhere else. But the copy is about the specific pains that client serving teams face. No, I don't know if I'm profitable. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know if I have the capacity to take on another project. No, I don't actually know what Gemma's doing. And that would be really cool if I could do that. By really choosing to solve a specific problem for their ICP, they went all in. And that also changed how they built the product because now they started introducing, not now, this is a year ago, they started in introducing more features that would actually help client team, client facing teams. So I think it feeds into each other, right? Like mm. you choose the audience that you're best fit to serve. And Teamwork does an amazing job help, helping client-facing teams. They're just so good at that. Yeah. And creating the right features for them, creating the right copy on the website that says, okay, we have reporting. Everyone has reporting, but here's how reporting helps you. Mm. Here's how time tracking helps you as a business owner. And here's how this tool or this feature helps you. So I think... It feeds into itself and it helps this kind of wheel of you're making your messaging better, you're making the product better, you're making messaging better. You're, everything kind of works together holistically. Yeah, yeah nice. And uh, so this comes down to basically understanding how to speak to your customers, which is basically usually like what to say and how to say it, right? How, I'm curious, yeah. and we can dive into your emotional targeting methodology as well. How do you prioritize, for example, you say you have, a couple of jobs to be done or emotional angles. How do you prioritize the ones that are most important to hit um, and how to uh, say message them on the page? So one of the things that we'll first do when we start working is a conversion optimization audit, let's call it, or emotional resonance audit. And I'll, I'll tell you what most companies do and then I'll tell you what I do and why it's different. So. Most audits, most zero audits focus on, I'm going to go into Google Analytics. I'm going to see where the problem is. I'm going to go to the website and I'm going to mark up things that don't make sense. Oh, you've got two calls to action. The form is too long. This is broken. This image is weird. This moves too much. And then you'll do that and you'll say, okay, so based on this, we want to do this A-B test. The way we approach it is actually quite different. And that is before we do any analysis on the pages, we'll actually go to the customer research. Mm. So we'll do voice of customer research and we'll do emotional research to uncover the top three pains that lead people to our client's website, the top three obstacles that are, you know, preventing them from converting, the top three things that they say they value the most about our client's product, the pains that it reduced for them how they want to feel after they find a solution. 
And once we have that mapped out and we present this to the client, we'll say, here are your the top. And, and usually our client will come to us and say, these are our ICP, which is great. Mm. But now I'm going to go do the research to say, okay, does this all add up? What are the things that we're missing? And then we'll present and say, here's who we're speaking to. Here's what you are saying on your website. Mm. One, two, three, and four. Here's what you should be saying. Uh. And it's a lot easier when you have your customer's lens on to then audit the website. It's You don't have to be a magician because once you have that data, you'll look at it and you're like, oh, I'm telling stories that don't resonate. I'm focused on this feature. I should be actually focusing on this feature. Or I'm saying all this, but I'm saying it wrong. Or this is the wrong testimonial. So we flip it. We first look at the research and then through that lens, we'll audit the website. And that makes a big difference because it's not based on best practices and what we think will work, but it's actual insight driven hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And from there, we'll go on and say, okay, let's go into Google Analytics. Okay. The biggest opportunity for impact is optimizing the pricing page. If we optimize the pricing page, that's going to be much better. And we use our insights to drive that. Sometimes that means speaking to two or three different people on a page. Sometimes on the homepage, more or less, that's always the case, right? The homepage is always a catch-all. You have to speak to a few different types of audiences. Mm -hmm. But it's a story that you tell and not that you have to just choose one. You can talk about the most important things. And you also have to choose who you're speaking to, the person who is evaluating the product, the person who's buying the product, the person who's using the product. So we'll choose that based on each page. Yeah. But first one, we'll insights, and then we can go in and optimize. Yeah. One thing that you wrote on LinkedIn, I saw it. One of the things that's important to, yeah, to differentiate and to speak the right way to the right people is explaining why the solution is important for them. And one thing that came to mind when I read this was, okay, but what's the boundary between having to explain too much? Maybe if some people are not aware enough and like the right amount of why explanation? A good question. I think it really depends on the page. Mm. If it's a home page, then, and this isn't a rule of thumb, okay? Because things change, obviously. But on a home page, I'd probably write less and direct them to a page to learn more. If I'm on a comparison page, I'd probably write like 5,000 words because they need to understand everything. So it's not just about understanding the message and over explaining, it's also choosing the time and where to do it. I completely agree with you. I don't think you, you need to tell it all, definitely not on the homepage, but if you have a good product page and if you have a good white paper, if you have a good onboarding sequence, that's telling a story through six or seven emails, then go ahead and do it. Mm. But it just depends on where you're saying this message and, and who you're meeting. Yeah. I'm curious, you mentioned the customer journey and now like email, various pages, white papers. Do you use a document or like an artifact or something to make sure that the emotional targeting is aligned throughout all the customer journey? How do you do that? Yeah, we definitely look at everything, the whole customer journey. When we start working, we have a goal. Sometimes a client will say, we're trying to increase conversions of leads or sales or free trials. And through that lens, we'll look at um, the most impactful customer journey and funnel. Mm -hmm. And that also means emails and that also means ads. And that also means the white papers and the different things that people go through. And we analyze them all. And we definitely, we don't tackle them all at the same time because you can't always do that. And you also want to test, but with B2B, it's actually been a good and successful way for us to start with email and with ads versus the website itself and landing pages, because not all B2B companies have enough traffic. And if I want to test something using email to test new messaging ideas or new visuals or for one of our clients, we completely changed the navigation on the website. That was a huge thing. And it was all through the emotional lens. That's not always easy to A-B test. We managed, but not every company can. So having those different points beforehand that allow you to test like easily mm. is crucial. Yeah. I'm curious, how do you test emotional resonance in the navigation? And also, 
on buttons, that was the other curiosity that I had. Yeah, I think when people hear me talk about emotional targeting or emotional resonance, we think about copy and that's, it's true. Messaging is probably the most important thing for sure. Yeah. But you also do it through design or through user experience. One of the things that we did with teamwork was we A-B tested their navigation on the website. And that is very big. Um, and what we did is what we used our research to understand what pages these customers need or these prospects need to go through and what they need to read in order to be convinced that teamwork is the right solution for them. And that meant going from a, uh, the general menu that most companies have, which is like home, product, features, pricing, to telling actual stories on in navigation. And that I think is really cool because what we did is it's not that we had an increase in conversions there, which was great. Okay. That was lovely and definitely what we wanted. But the most interesting thing was to see people go through the rabbit hole and go deeper and deeper into the product. So we changed headlines from like product to built for businesses who do client work. And then the specific types of ICP that Teamwork has, we called out the specific, the, the four or three biggest problems that they're probably trying to solve. We did that through our research. We're like, they want to know how to plan stuff. They want to know how to allocate resources. They want to know how to do project collaboration. Let's call that out. Instead of having the actual feature as a name, let's use the problem in there. When we spoke about the product, we spoke about the specific things they care about. When we wanted to show them use cases, we said, companies like you, here's how agencies, here's how client servicing teams are using teamwork. So it was more about just giving them the information they care about and that emotionally resonates with you. It's mm. not that you're like feeling all happy and, and cuddly about teamwork. It's just that I go on to the menu and I'm like, oh yeah, that is what I care about. I, those are my four biggest problems. I do want to yeah. know about this. Like don't need a, just that one page that shows integrations and mm. reporting. And no, I want, oh yes, that does solve the problem. Yeah. Emotional resonance is throughout the entire customer journey and it's on buttons too. It's everything that you do should be crystal clear for someone where I'm like, oh, I get this is built for me. I know what's going to happen when I click on this. I know what information I'm going to get or I know what the next step is going to be. And that makes sense to me on, a, on it resonates with me. That makes mm -hmm. sense. This is the actual next step that I should take because I feel comfortable that you can provide the information I need. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned the navigation, I just had this thought, there's, there's this uh, like heuristic in, in UX, I remember it's from Nielsen Norman Group, where basically they say, try to keep as much as possible of your UX UI as similar as to what users are familiar with. So that they don't mm. have to think or reinvent the wheel, basically. So I, I was wondering, how do you test for uh, your prospects' mental models, how they think currently about uh, other navigations, for example, and how do you decide? Okay, we can go with something a bit more, like, a bit different here because they're not as attached to to, to common other examples. I, I think that's a great call out because there's two pieces there. One is it's we didn't completely change. It's not that now you'd land on teamwork and what is this navigation? It's very clear where you're clicking and what yeah. you're doing. It's just, it's not calling out. So the actual menu on top is very similar to anything else you'll see, but the drop downs are different uh, okay. and they get you to go in and say, okay, yes, I do care about this or I do care about that. And then it's easier to navigate. So when you go to teamwork, you'll see product, compare us, resources, pricing, but the drop downs are different. I will say that when we did comparison pages for Teamwork, we actually interviewed a bunch of people that switched from one product to Teamwork. And then we also did some blind testing with people that had never used Teamwork specifically, but do use project management solutions. Mm -hmm. And we walked them through five or six different websites to see how they engage with navigation, mm. with the whole page, with a comparison page. We asked them specific questions and we watched how they use it. So we also applied all of the research and the insights from that to other things like the menu. Because when I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, of our conversation, 
We know that in B2B, most people land on the homepage, check the pricing page, and then come back. Mm -hmm. That's because we did user testing and we watched dozens of people do this where they're like, and you can hear them and they'll say out loud, I just want to see the pricing is the same. Mm -hmm. And then I can dig into the product. And, and this matters because with the pricing page, you think you have to do all this stuff, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's just, it's a, there's a difference between the first time you look at the pricing page and the second time you look yeah, at the pricing yeah, page. Yeah. So yeah, we, we definitely look at all these kind of things mm. and apply those. In. But again, I want to say it's not magic, right? It's all testing and we get a lot of things wrong too. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever tried changing the, like the usual pricing and navigation with something else? I'm curious because I heard Joanna Weeb, a copy actress from once. She had this idea of like, why do you need to call it pricing? Why don't you call it something a bit more like value oriented? Have you ever done it? I haven't. I, I have to say, I haven't tried that. Joe says something. I usually bow down and say, this sounds incredible. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say anything against what Joe says because she probably does better than I do. I would be curious though, because I think pricing is just something that B2B buyers are conditioned mm. to look into. And one of the things that, one of the emotional I'd say says that B2B purchases have is that a lot of the time the person buying the product isn't the one paying for it. And what that means is that you've been given a budget to look into certain types of products and choose one. And as a person who doesn't decide that budget, you actually have to, like, you have that scare that you're going to choose a product that they won't approve or they'll think they'll think you are exaggerating. So there's an emotional piece there where you like, you just want to show them the pricing. You just want to give it to them. Mm. And I don't know if a value-based copy would be like something different would necessarily take that away. But I do think yeah. it's a very automatic thing that people do in B2B. They mm. immediately check out pricing. So I don't know if I'd want to take that away. Even I would even argue where you place it in your menu also matters. Mm. Like where it is in that, in like the order. What, what do you mean? Did you see drastic differences there? Well, I think some companies, usually what you'd see is you have like one, two, three, and then pricing. Yeah. Like there'll be about uh, product, whatever it is, and then pricing, and then the blog. I have seen dummy clicks in, in like recordings where people are just so automatically used to it being in the fourth uh, position. And, they click and I think else. It's so crazy. Yeah. And then they'll click on stuff and you see them clicking back and looking for pricing. So I've seen that happen. I think we, like when I started, let's say two years ago, when I started seeing a lot of B2B companies creating tabs on their website, I hated it. On the homepage, suddenly everyone was having tabs. No one wanted long form copy. So you suddenly get this section and you're clicking on tabs and people had to manually click on things to see things change. And I said, this sucks. Like, I don't like this. And people are going to not see it. Mm -hmm. And then there were tabs on the top. And then there were tabs on the bottom. And then you could move arrows. And I really didn't like it. Now, in this day and age, I think I still don't like it. But we've trained B2B buyers to just know there's tabs. Mm -hmm. So they're just used to clicking for the tabs. So. Yeah. Now you have to use tabs <laughs> because people expect them. Yeah. Um, you can shift behavior, but I don't know if it's always for the best. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Also, I'm super curious. Speaking of testing, so especially in B2B, I'm always looking into new ways of doing it just because it's not super easy. And you mentioned usability testing and user recordings, for example. So I, I worked at a usability testing startup, so I used to watch loads and loads of user testing videos every day and I know the value, but I was curious to hear from you, what do you look specifically for in user test recordings or user test moderated user tests that you run versus user recordings, for example, hot jar user recordings? I would say that it really depends on what the goal is. And I think that's super important. It feels redundant to say, but I have to remind myself to actually say this. I think a lot of the time, especially with heat maps and recordings, a lot of the times people just go in and watch. Mm, yeah. And that's not good. So you have to come, you have to log into this, whatever tool you're using with a question. 
you have to say, this is the specific question I need answered. Because if you don't come in with a question, you're going to be hypothesizing a bazillion things and writing down a lot of stuff and you're not actually focused on what you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. For me, the question is always, what am I trying to solve? Do I want to know why people are dropping out on a certain page? Am I trying to figure out if something resonates? Do, am I trying to figure out if something's confusing? Once I have that question answered, like once I know what the question is, sorry, then I have a much better time watching user recordings, for example, because I know what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. um, what I'm looking to answer. When you're doing user testing, that's a little different. You still have a question, but usually you have a few of those because you finally have someone in the room or online or whatever, and you want to take as much as you can. And there too, like Elsa Ertz is like the best person to talk to about this, right? Like she is the OG. But I think the difference here is that you're way more involved with speaking to people or giving them directions. Mm. And here, when I can, I just, I'm mostly actually not looking at, I know this sounds very weird because it's user testing. So a lot of times you're like saying, go to this page, then navigate to here, try and do this. But what I'm actually looking at, especially when I'm on camera, I'm like, I just want to see their face. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to react to things. I want them to talk out loud and say things of what are they thinking? Mm. What are, what's going through their mind? And that's very different than user recordings, right? When you're just like, I just, I'm just looking at behavior, but I don't really know if the phone rang or if they got a text message or whatever happened. So that to me is the difference, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and at what point in your process do you typically do user testing? Is it before the research, after, both? We do both. Some clients, we did this for Bitly a few months ago because we wanted to figure out something very specific about the user journey. And we've been working with them for two years. Mm. So I think it really depends on Again, the questions we're trying to get answered. We don't always do user testing up front. It's actually a harder buy-in, I think, unless someone comes in and they're like, this is what we need. We do it more once we really understand the business better, I think, and the customer is better to be able to like say, now I want to speak to people and I want to get what's not working. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right. I know that you recently spoke at Moscon, right? Yes. And, and you had a couple of takeaways that I loved that I wanted to dive into, which you wrote about two clusters of emotion uh, that people have. Mm -hmm. So one is how we want to feel about ourselves. And the other one is how we want others to see us, which I think if you understand those in B2B, that's when you hit the mark. Can you tell us yes. uh, a bit more about those? Of course. Self-image and social image. So self-image is, is how I want to feel about myself. I want to feel proud. I want to feel successful. I want to feel smart. And social image is really, as you said, how I want others. And that means they respect me. Maybe they see me as the go-to person in the office. Maybe I get a cool promotion from this. It all kind of fits into those emotions. Because one of the most common questions I get is, what is the most important emotion in B2B? And I'll, and, and I'll say, it's not one. It's multiple. There are clusters of emotions. So one cluster is self-image and the other is social. It's always a bunch of things, but the motivation really is from within. I think with Google found that B2B buyers are eight times more likely to pay a pricier uh, fee mm. if they find a personal value from mm. it. So they will pay more for a product if they see personal gain. This is not just me hypothesizing. This is actual research done mm. on 3,000 to be shoppers. So ultimately, these are, in my opinion, the most important emotions because when you are writing on your website or if you're choosing visuals or if you're talking about your technology, you always want to think about how it benefits your customers on those two levels. You don't have to choose. You can test to see what they care about more. With Strata, we created the identity hero within the company. So it's a, it's an identity protection uh, company, very amazing business. You don't really necessarily think there's an emotional thing going on there, but we really went in and focused on the identity hero of the company. And that is really resonating for a lot of companies. In fact, they were saying that 
even at conferences where they go and they present and all sorts of exhibitions, people mention this to them. Yeah. So it's, you can find this in every single, no matter what you're selling. And people really care about their personal benefit. It's not buying a t-shirt where you're saying, okay, obviously I'm buying this on emotion because I want to look good. This is more powerful because you are buying for, when you're buying for yourself, you're just buying for yourself or maybe a significant other. But when you're buying for a company, mm. whoa, it's their pressure. What if everything gets deleted in a freak accident? What if no one uses this tool? What if everyone hates me? What if, I don't know. So those two are really crucial for everything that you do. And, and I agree with you. If you do that, you hit the mark. You do those out, for example, in customer interviews. How do you do that? Do you, yeah. do you look at like the subcontext of what they say, or do you ask specific questions that reveal those? Both, both. Definitely ask specific questions about what are the things that they, that the problems that the product lessens them the most, what are things that they would say to their friends to recommend this product if they wanted to recommend. One of Elsa's questions, which I love is if you could no longer use this product, what would you miss the most? Which I yeah. love because it's, it's not about what feature do you like? <laughs> it's, so we do ask questions that lead to that, but we also definitely look at subcontext too. We look at conscious and, and unconscious, like what you, what, the biases that we have ourselves. Mm. And we'll sometimes just plain out ask, have you benefited from this in any way on a personal level? How do you feel? Has it made you feel in any way? And sometimes I'll say, I actually feel a lot more confident now. I, can't, I feel more confident in my decisions. Or when we did the QA software, we worked with a QA software company uh -huh. and someone said to me, I finally matter. No one cares about QA engineers and I finally <laughs> matter. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the whole thing, like they get ignored. So no, you're not going to get ignored anymore. So yeah. you can ask all questions and you can also read into it. Nice. All right. My last couple of questions. I wanted to ask about your newsletter. You mentioned that you're, you've been reworking your newsletter, revamping it. And it's something that you won't, I also want to do with mine. So how are you going about it and why? I'm doing it because I want to, first of all, because I'm not sending enough emails, sent the market at, but I'm really <laughs> not. And the reason is because I don't have a good structure to them. I've been doing this for many years, like eight, let's say, forget uplift and many more beforehand. But most of my emails have always been just me sitting in front of a blank page and just writing what I feel like. This is what happened this week. This is what I tested mm. this week. This, went, this didn't work. This did. And I need a better structure. So that was one thing I want some, I want it to be easier for me to fill in those gaps. I want to help people know what to expect when they get our emails. And I want to call out specific things every week. So a lot of this restructuring is really about making sure that I'm delivering more value. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where it came from. The way I'm going about it is I brain dump as I do, which mm -hmm. I have Liz, our copywriter, she's just interviewing me and the team and yeah. I brain dump a bunch of here's what I think blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and she's structuring it out for us and there's definitely the goal of okay we're going to send weekly emails and we're going to be focusing on these specific things so it's giving me focus and it's also making sure that and the, everyone and anyone on the list really gets the value they need mm -hmm. all right the other thing I wanted to ask which I ask all of my guests is where do you go to learn new stuff a good question. I think that changes a lot. I go to specific people. I have groups of people that I speak to and I brainstorm with. So there's that when I'm like, I have a challenge or I have a problem or my client has a problem and I want to solve it. So I will ask specific people I know who have dealt with these things and I will ask them. Mm -hmm. I have the Shine Crew, which is a group of women that we've been supporting each other for over a decade now. Joe is one of them and April Dunford and a bunch of other really successful people I have no business being with in, <laughs> in the group. And we talk to each other a lot and learn a lot from each other, a ton. I used to think I could learn a bit from LinkedIn. I no longer think that because uh, it's just become ugh, which is a very Jewish ugh, oh my <laughs> God. But I think... I mostly, I listen to podcasts, I read books, mm. and I try to be very intentional about what I want to learn and mm. where. So it's mostly reaching out to the right people. Nice. What's a book that you're reading now? 
I'm actually rereading two books. I'm rereading Forget the Funnel by Gia ah, and yeah. Claire, uh, which is phenomenal. Just a must read. And I'm rereading April Dumpard's book again, just because the positioning yeah. book is her first book is freaking incredible. Yeah. I also just finished Ross Simmons' book, which mm. is wow. He writes about distribution and he basically like maps out his entire thing. If you actually followed it to a T, you'd probably be super famous and make a shit money. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, he's really good. So those are the three books I've been focusing on. Lately. Oh, yeah. I'll definitely check out the um, uh, Simmons one for sure. I haven't read that. So. I have it. Nice. It's called Create yeah. Once, Distribute Forever. Uh, it's really good. How great creators spread their ideas and how uh, you can too. I need it, especially with the podcast, I need to create one and just do it forever. <laughs> and lastly, speaking of books, I know that you've been writing a book. What's the yep. progress there? And can you tell us a bit more about that? It looks like a secret nobody knows about. <laughs> it's not a secret. I'm just not very good at like building uh, whatever, as they call it on LinkedIn. <laughs> what, uh, building in public. Building in public. Know, <laughs> I'm writing a book about emotion and B2B. I'm basically write, show, teaching my framework of how to do it. I am in the middle of it, I would say. I'm like, I've done the first chapters, which are all about just like convincing people like, hey, you need emotion and explaining the different things. And I'm right into teaching the framework. I'm going to keep mm -hmm. it very like short. I don't want it to be a very long book mm -hmm. and I want it to be very actionable. So yeah, um, yeah I'm, wor I'm working on it and I should post more about it. I will do that. That's my... <laughs> What's the, do you have a publication date in mind? I'm hoping January 2025 is nice. the goal. <laughs> Hopefully I won't be doing another interview in January and saying June. <laughs> the goal is very <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Where can people find you? So getuplift.com is your website, a newsletter Dot as pro. well. Dot co. Oh, okay. Dot pro. Yeah. And really annoying. <laughs> Obviously, so the website, LinkedIn is a good spot to find me. And mostly just ranting about other people's posts. And also on Twitter slash X or whatever he calls it next. Yeah, that, that's where I am. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Dalia. It's been wonderful and learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, the best thing you could do to support the show and help me as a small business owner would be to leave a review. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and let me know what you think. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe. And if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions for future episodes, just hit me up on LinkedIn at Christopher Silvestri or Twitter at Silvestri Chris. Speak to you next time.